Good afternoon, uh, I'm Guillermo Diaz Podido, and today I would like to um, share a little bit of the work that we've been doing, um, looking at the interaction between crustose coral and algae as, and um, coral uh, level settlements. And also to share with you some ideas that we have in terms of extracting chemical compounds from coral and algae to induce natural settlement uh, in the reef. So, as uh, a bit of background, um, um, coral reef recovery uh, after, dis after disturbances generally uh, requires successful coral sediment. And for this process to be successful, the larvae needs to find the right ecological conditions and also, um, and also to look for the um, appropriate or adequate microhabitat. For many coral species, um, the larvae, the larvae prefer to settle on substrates covered by crustose coral and algae. And we see that here in this slide where we have the um, CCA of crustose coral and alga, Titanoderma, and a bunch of coral larvae here settled on the surface of the alga. So this uh, raises a number of really interesting uh, questions or ideas in the context of uh, reef restoration. Like for example, how can we use this knowledge to enhance natural uh, settlement in the reef, therefore contributing to reef recovery? And more specifically, can we use the chemical extracts from the coral and algae to enhance um, um, settlement of coral larvae? And more specifically, we would like to take it a step further and try to synthesize these compounds from the coral and algae so we could um, uh, synthesize the compounds and you know, have them here in a, in a vial and then take them out to the reef and spread it onto the reef and enhance uh, uh, reef recovery contributing to um, yeah, reef health. So, but this is, uh, so to answer these questions, we gotta go through a number of steps, and some of which we have addressed in my lab at Griffith, and others are just ideas that I'm here sharing with you. So, first thing we need to do is to actually determine whether CCAs are inducers of coral settlement, and if they do, we would like to identify which are the species of coral and algae that induce highest rates of um, uh, settlement. And we've done some work on this. We've, we've got a uh, large settlement here across a bunch of species of coral and algae, and what you see here is there are a group of coral and algae that induce high rates of coral settlement, and there are other species that are totally avoided by the by coral algae. Now, we also want to um, look at the mechanisms that explain this interaction, whether that's mediated by chemical interactions or microbial interactions, and this is uh, elaborating on the work that people at Ames uh, have done. And also, this is the work that my PhD student, Louis, uh, did in, in our group. So basically, he demonstrated that uh, the induction of coral larval settlement on the coral and algae is all mediated by chemical um, interaction with a minor contribution of the microbial communities. Now we want to take that um, this um, um, status a step uh, further and try to isolate and identify the chemical identify the chemical compounds. And Lewis has done some really interesting work um, in this, and this is work in progress. But we're basically identifying some of the molecules that induce settlement of the corals. And ideally, we want to go a step, a step even further and work with the Griffith Institute for Drug Discovery. They've done wonderful uh, work looking at uh, drugs to cure malaria and other things. So we would like to work with them to uh, synthesize these molecules. And once we have that, we would love to go and do some trials, test whether these chemicals uh, actually work and therefore contributing to reef restoration. So we've done some work in this, um, in this area here. We've done limited work here and definitely we would like to uh, you know, start working in these areas here. And I think that's all the time that I have for my talk. Hi, uh, my name is Doug Baird. I'm the Environment and Compliance Manager for the Quicksilver Group. We are one of the largest marine operators on the Great Barrier Reef. And I'm supposed to be talking about a local reef stewardship in the face of global climate change, a tourism operator's perspective. So I thought we'd try and put it into context a little bit. Historically, this is how people used to go to see the reef. They used to go out to the islands, snorkel off the islands. As you can imagine, you have a big problem with the corals here. You really can't move your operation. You have limited scope to move them because you've got to be in the uh, the wind shade that the island creates. You can't go around right the other side of the island. It's it a little bit too lumpy to actually snorkel there. 
everything's changed a little bit. So when I say marine tourism, most people would think that's what you're going to go out on. That's silver sunny on a mooring. Now that's on a fore and aft mooring. That's roughly say 40 tonne of concrete holding that vessel there. So you've got 20 tonne at the fore, 20 tonne at the aft. So it is a little bit movable. If we had a real problem with that side, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has the tourism contingency plan, so we could move site. Logistically, it's fairly difficult, but it is possible. We also have platforms, or what we call pontoons. Now, there you've gone up, so effectively what we've done is create a man-made island, so you can take people out to the, the outer edge of the reef. These are a little bit harder to move. We've got, as a 45 metre vessel, tied up alongside. We have 10 3 tonne anchors, 225 tonne of concrete and hundreds of metres of studling chain holding that in place. Now that's all put in under the supervision of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. So it's done with a degree or a nicety of precision that is, is very good. Huge amounts of environmental impact statements and studies done before that can be put in. If you were lucky enough to hear Wendy Morris' talk yesterday, she was the first person to start doing uh, monitoring on the, the quicksilver vessels. And a lot of the, the monitoring studies and the uh, sort of monitoring that they did on a daily basis formed the basis of the Iron Reef program that Kabrumpa have adopted and have expanded uh, a little bit from there. So as you can see, this, and there's another shot over here, it's very difficult to relocate. The actual sites that we could find to relocate that to are few and far between. The logistics of getting that anchoring system in, because we actually built a model, scale model, which all the marine park managers and ourselves could walk around about, we could explain where we were going to put the anchors. We could look at the coral colonies that were going to be at risk. We relocated some of those coral colonies because the anchor had to go there. The coral was going to be at risk. It would have died if we put it there. So we relocated them, and they, they survived quite well. So we're now in the space of being very interested in reef rehabilitation. So we're working with Reef Ecologic and we've got a, a research project going out on this site to try and rehabilitate an area of unconsolidated coral rubble that was damaged by site. <coughs> but again, that works for that particular site. We're looking for a, a suite of different techniques that can be used depending on the zone of the reef that we need to work on. It's not going to be one shoe fits all. It's not going to be one specific type of restoration project that's going to work for everybody. It will depend on, are you working on the reef flat? Are you working on the slope? Are you working on sand? Are you working on the saddle of a coral bobbing? These are all different areas. They're all going to require different techniques. And I believe the tourism industry are uniquely placed to help a lot of you guys, as researchers, take that next step. You know, you've maybe done some work in tanks, limited pilot projects, what does it work? How does it work in the real world? Does it work out or does it not? I know that the Marine Park Authority are kind of in the space where they're willing to project or willing to permit projects to find out what does work. And they're quite keen for operators such as ourselves to actually work with you guys and get a good result. How are we doing tackle-wise? <laughs> so, to sum it up really, I mean, we, we've been looking after this site. We, having a site like this generates a real stewardship mentality within the operation, within the operators. We don't want to hide what's going on. We are very conscious of coral bleaching. We're very worried about coral bleaching. If we lose that reef site, you know, we, I don't know if we'll be able to find another. So we are in that space of trying to, to work with you guys. If you've got ideas that you believe will help us, I mean, we've been back by Crown Thorn staff, which we've taken hundreds, well, thousands, I think about 60,000 pounds of on starfish off that surrounding reef. Uh, and we've been doing that independently uh, before APTO so kicked in. APTO help us now because we are members of APTO. But we want to look after it. You guys, I think, can help us.
and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Australian Coastal Restoration Network. Um, before I go into my presentation, I just want to thank all the people who are along the bottom of my presentation, on my slide there, so Trotwater, JCU, um, NES, and the Nature Conservancy who have been funding this, um, the set up of this network, so um, just to acknowledge them. Um, so it all started um, um, there we go. It all started um, back in August last year where um, 60 marine and coastal scientists met um, from academia, from research, um, from industry, from NGOs um, at, uh, at JCU in Townsville and we um, had a roundtable conversation about um, coastal restoration that's currently occurring in Australia. It was the first time that we had all sort of gotten together to learn more about what everybody else is doing in this space, and this included people working in seagrass, in salt marsh, mangroves, um, shellfish reef restoration, coral restoration, and at the end of that um, uh, uh, two-day symposium, we had a roundtable agreement that we really needed a network that brought all of those specialist, specialist, um, specialist areas um, together into one easy way for people to actually communicate and network with each other. And that was how the Australian Coastal Restoration Network was born. Okay, it's just a bit slow. Okay. So, um, the intent of the Coastal Restoration Network was not to replace anything that already existed. So there was obviously already, um, I need to go back a bit there. Um, there was already um, networks in place, so at a much larger level we had um, the Society for Ecological Restoration, um, the uh, Australian Marine Science Association, the Australian Coastal Society and the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand. Um, we didn't want to replace those, we weren't looking to become a national body that um, was involved in advocacy, we just wanted to be able to provide a platform that gave everybody um, working in restoration in the marine environment a place where they can communicate and share work. We also didn't want to replace the existing smaller scale networks where they were very much ecosystem based, so shellfish, reef, uh, seagrass, they very much have their own place and their own requirement and people need to be able to communicate very much directly on a technical level. We saw ourselves sitting somewhere in the middle, um, somewhere a, a way to bring all of those individual ecosystems together and to be able to provide an easy link with the much larger national and international organisations. Okay, it's just a bit slow, this thing, that's the problem is. So, like I said, we weren't trying to replace any existing networks. We wanted to provide support to existing smaller networks so that they had a resource and the means to actually do more things than just meet once a year. Um, we wanted to provide an avenue for people to be able to share information and to connect different disciplines, um, be able to, um, to attend larger um, national conferences by having dedicated streams for marine restoration where they weren't there previously, um, provide a single location for marine restoration resources within Australia, um, and provide a means for people working um, and who are interested in coastal restoration. So it's, this network isn't just for practitioners or for academics, it's for everybody. It's for the community, for traditional owners, for anybody who has an interest in marine restoration wants to be able to connect with people in the space and to learn a bit more about what's actually happening and how they can get involved. So this is the official launch of the website that I've been working on um, for the last six months. Um, I'm a marine scientist. <laughs> site development but I worked it out. Um, so um, we've officially launched www.acrn.org.au. Please check us out. Um, at the moment it's pretty um, rudimentary. We have a bit about who we are. Um, there's a way, um, there's a, a means to connect to us, a join us section. Um, I've got some useful links on there so if I'm missing something please let me know. Um, and some of the news and events so um, conferences, workshops, things coming up. Like I said, it's really a growing, evolving thing, um, very much open to ideas. There's been some conversations around having a network for, for coral reef restoration, because that doesn't exactly exist in the same form as some of the other disciplines. 
Um, and we can facilitate that as well if that's something that the field feels is necessary. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This next talk is based on the question, can underwater art help reef restoration science? What a big question. STEM, I think just about all of you can identify with STEM. Science, technology, engineering, maths. I reckon most of the room is STEM. But what if you were STEAM? Would you be more powerful if you involved arts in STEM. Yes, you would. 97, 98% of Australians identify strongly with art. And I'm sure that's similar throughout the rest of the planet. What percentage of Australians identify with science? I couldn't find a figure, but 16% of Australians do some form of citizen science. Just think about those figures while I'm giving this talk. Art and science, they're so different they're so similar. The left side of the brain, the right side of the brain. One is subjective and it's all about beauty. One is objective and it's all about truth. We need both. We shouldn't be fighting, we should be collaborating. That has also been one of the key messages of this conference. If you ask people what they think about the Great Barrier Reef or any reefs throughout the world, they don't talk about numbers, they don't talk about crowds, or maybe they do at these conferences. But if you ask a thousand people, what does the Great Barrier Reef mean to you? It's about beauty, it's about colour, it's about aesthetics. So again, think about that in terms of the reef and restoration. So I'm going to share two ideas. This first one is called the Museum of Underwater Art. It's taking advantage of a world-class sculptor called Jason DeCares Taylor, who's got a social media following of one billion people. He's created infrastructure in Mexico, Spain, the Maldives, Fiji, and we've been talking to him about something special on the Great Barrier Reef. Here's some of his conceptual drawings. Indigenous, mangrove man, underwater gardening, and oceanic futures. We're trying to use this as a touchstone to get everyone to care about the reef, have conversations, be more sustainable and do more. So the Museum of Underwater Art, we're proposing four sites accessible to everyone. Free on the Strand and Magnetic Island and Palm Island to help the Indigenous community and the Outer Barrier Reef. We haven't put in an application yet, but we've been talking to the management of the agencies for several years. We've currently got $2 million of funding, and if we want it to be super significant, we need more. But there's a whole lot of people that are really supportive, including the private sector, philanthropists, and researchers, which is fantastic. Um, the second project I'm going to talk about is in the Sundays, and this is about science and art. We're going to try and experiment. We're going to put art out there and see what people think. This is more the social side, but it's also the natural. We're going to put it in the intertidal, we're going to put it on land, we're going to put it underwater. And we're going to see what people think, where they like it, where they think it could be improved, and also what the fish and the birds and the whole ecosystem thinks about this part. So that's the plan. We've got an application in. We're working very closely with the government. That's super exciting. The science of the art. So the Wit Sunday is funded by both the Commonwealth and the state government to the tune of about a million dollars. It's pretty compressed within 18 months, but we're trying to do a whole range of things for the reef and for the tourism industry and for education, and there's so much support, it's fantastic. We've got some huge challenges, but really excited about the project. And it's also an international year of the reef event, and there's $450,000 for art. We've got a call for artists out there at the moment. So finally, in response to the question, can underwater art help reef restoration science? Absolutely. We should be thinking about these ideas because only if we get 98% of the people on board can we make a difference. Thanks very much.
Hello everyone, I'm Corinne I'm here. I'm a like, grad student over at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And hopefully this starts working. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to be talking about how diversity and non-random transplanting of corals can uh, impact their growth over time. Um, so my project takes place on Palmyra Atoll. Um, so this restoration experiment takes place on Palmyra. It's an uninhabited atoll in the Northern Line Islands. And back in the early 1990s, there was a coral morph outbreak that began, um, the epicenter of which is denoted by this red star. Um, as of now, and over the past about 15 years, this coral morph has been covering multiple hectares of reef, uh, apparently overgrowing and killing hard corals and other dominant biota in the process. Uh, which has been raising concerns over the long-term implications of this invasion on reef health around the atoll. So this led our team to create a coral restoration experiment uh, designed to evaluate whether restoration at the epicenter of this outbreak is A, feasible, and B, if it can be scaled up to other parts of the reef. So to carry out this experiment, we first had to remove coral morph. So we did this by finding locations that were nearly 100% coral morph using secured tarps and granular chlorine to create a bare calcium carbonate substrate upon which we transplanted corals. I'll get to that part a little bit more in the next few slides. And we've been monitoring these sites ever since the beginning of this restoration experiment back in 2014. <coughs> so for this, we use three different types of corals, each of which is quite common on this part of the reef. We have a branch necropora, a posophora, and a hontopora. And uh, as for experimental design, we have 15 plots total, each of which is about nine square meters. So from left to right, we have our control plots, our control plus coral morph removal, and our coral morph removal plus coral transplantation. And within this coral transplantation, we have three different treatments. So we have corals that were transplanted next to their con specifics, next to their heterospecifics, and next to, uh, sorry, um, randomized uh, within each plot. So let's take a look at what these transplant plots look like as of recent. Should I click it again? No. So here we have the same species to aggregate plot in 2016, now 2017. Here we have our Montipora, Tosilopora, and Acropora. Um, as you can see, the coral morph uh, invasion is quite minimal. You can't really see any right here. Additionally, we had a lot of increase in Acropora cover by 2017. Um, here we have a random plot. Keep in mind we have these um, PVC here, which is a half meter. You can use that for scale. Um, additionally, we did have um, corals that were not one of the three species come into these plots, which you can see right here. So there is um, a good amount of um, new corals coming into these plots. Lastly, we have our multi-species aggregate plot. Here you can see those aggregates. Um, additionally, we had quite a bit of possible coral recruitment by 2017. You can see uh, some of those around here. And then once again, we have this large sexual, asexual reproduction in a cropper by 2017. So now that you've qualitatively seen what these plots are looking like, let's go back and quantify what's happening. So here we have our spatial, or sorry, here we have our change in coral percent cover from 2014 to 17. And we can see that we have the most increase in coral cover when we have this multi species aggregate. Um, if we want to break this down to species specific, uh, we see some interesting trends. So it seems as though this increase in coral cover is mainly due to acropora. Uh, conversely, this treatment seemed to include the growth of Montipora, which actually happened to do a bit better in this random treatment where it was further separated from other corals. Um, also, Poslopora didn't really seem to be impacted much by spatial orientation. So, this really exemplifies just how important it is to think about life history traits and competitive ability of corals when you're creating a transplant experiment. Um, additionally, if we want to look at coral recruitment, um, not only did corals grow a lot in 2017, but we also had quite a bit of recruitment. Here we have the total number of recruits within each treatment. Um, and this trend is the same even if you were to look at the averages. Um, and what we can see here is that generally the substrate preparation, so this removal of the crown morph in these four plots, seemed to increase recruitment. And this um, increase was um, further improved by having aggregated corals, it would appear. So, in conclusion, 
Um, what we can say about this project is that socio preparation um, seems to assist in coral growth and coral recruitment. Um, on top of that, uh, this really shows how important it is when you're choosing corals that you want to transplant, that you want to really think about uh, life history traits of these corals, and if perhaps if you're maybe focusing on a singular species to grow in a certain environment, perhaps it would be beneficial to include other corals into your project because perhaps there's some sort of um, facilitation happening here with the acropora, which uh, further research should be done to look at uh, what might exactly be causing this. Um, yeah, so with that, thank you. And you can see there's this optimal level of aggregation in the species. 
Uh, so very important at low densities, less so at high densities. And we found that the reason things weren't as good at high densities uh, in terms of aggregation was because of an increase in sort of polyspermic fertilizations as well as a trade-off between sperm coverage and concentration. In terms of management implications, this means maintaining starfish below about three individuals per hectare, and that's based on aggregation and population density. It really also emphasises the importance of breaking up starfish aggregations at low population density. Because if you have a population density of three starfish per hectare, but if they're highly aggregated, they might have an equivalent reproductive output to a much higher population density, so say 10 starfish per hectare. We also did a number of sensitivities in our model, and we found that female skew populations uh, could really accelerate much quicker than sort of even sex ratios or male skewed sex ratios. And similarly, we found that an increase in sort of juvenile numbers uh, was an indicator of an incipient outbreak risk because as size of the individuals in the population increased, there was a dramatic increase in their reproductive potential. And through the same lens, we found that removing the largest starfish was going to give you the most bang for your buck because you're reducing the average size in the population. Uh, from here, I would like to sort of include these LE and aggregation uh, dynamics into a sort of population dynamics models and have a look at uh, finer scale trophic interactions, so things like habitat, prey, and predator abundance, and how that interacts with starfish aggregation. I'm still trying to figure out how you tell a male and female crown of thorns. Yeah, it is. Look Just a love Good afternoon. Plastics. 
or in the, in the form of climate change advice. The fact that everything that everyone does, wherever they are on the, on the planet, has an effect on the planet that we live in, means that our great symbol, our great icon, the Great Barrier Reef, um, uh, is important because what you do at home has an effect on it. So we started sitting in the Great Barrier Reef about two years ago. Um, it's, there we go, it's all working now. Its job was to engage the world in the future of the reef and by implication in the future of the planet. We divided it into two parts. First, a collaborative movement on the reef, so trying to work out how we can bring support, bring eyes on, bring uh, engagement with projects on the reef itself. And secondly, how you can take action wherever you are in the world. One of the great challenges is that people feel powers, one of the great challenges of the Great Barrier Reef is you read the headlines and go, what can I do? Um, and that's the same with climate change. So we're trying to address those two things. So some of the projects on the reef itself, I'm going to uh, speed it up already. Good. This is the slides showing it's been tech issues, huh? Um, so projects on the reef, some of them are here. Reef restoration there, you can see that Pablo, it's up there for you. Um, but projects all over the reef, we are currently building a thing which we call Citizen Atlas, which will show many of these projects. And also, uh, things that you can do with your school kid. Many of you will have hopefully heard the story of Molly, uh, the story of these stools and getting those stools out of restaurants and out of all the boats on the reef. So you start to build this really interesting ecosystem of people who care. Not just scientists, not just eight-year-olds, not just boat owners or skippers on boats, but everyone, and that is a movement. So the great challenge with movements, the great challenges on like Earth are is how do you start to measure what happened? One of our great challenges that we set ourselves as citizens is to try to illustrate the power of scale. So what happens if somebody says, all right, I'm not going to use a plastic cup or a plastic bag? What does that look like if you get thousands of people doing it or millions of people doing it? So that's the system that we've built. We're trying to build essentially a feedback system that allows you to show the difference that somebody can make, whether they're here in Cairns or somewhere on the other side of the world wants to do something for the reef. So you can check it out, come sit and check this out. And then finally, wrapping up very quickly, this is says Natlas. It will be ready in a uh, minimum viable product by the end of August. It will show two things at first. The first will be the effect of all the people around the world who are doing citizens are taking part. And secondly, it will start to show the projects that are happening on the reef itself. So yeah, if you have projects, join up to citizens, let us know what your project is. We think we've got a lot already, obviously working with people like Adam to, uh, to uh, uh, get as many of those down in RRC. But um, early days for this project, but an amazing opportunity with Red Barrier Reef in these troubled times to illustrate to the rest of the world what we can do. And the last thing I think before Sheldon pulls me off the stage is uh, the importance of words. One of the worst headlines last year or this year was the one about cooking the reef. And it wasn't that what was written was necessarily wrong, it was that every single word seems to count. So the idea of this is to try and bring together the most positive, the best stuff that's happening on the reef, keep it real, be honest about what's going on, but um, be careful with our words as well. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, I'm Richard Quincy, Director with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority uh, and working in implementing the, the Queensland Government and the Australian Government's Joint Field Management Program. So it's a partnership that's uh, lasted for 40 years. Uh, I've got a truncated my talk a bit, so I'm going to skip through a few things pretty quickly. I want to talk about the complexity of climate change brings to management, uh, decisions, for interventions, uh, examples of some things we have been doing in the World Heritage Area, although most of those are terrestrially based, uh, and looking at considerations for what that means for local active restoration in the marine uh, environment. Just a very quick history to say that we have changed our management of the reef over time. You've heard uh, much of this talk, we'll touch on things people have talked about. We started with the Marine Park in 1970 about limestone mining, uh, and we've progressed through You'll see some things like cops keep coming back, so I think that's one of the things in the climate change context for us as well. Uh, I want to want to stress that the climate change and then cyclones and, and other activity are things that we need to keep in mind 
in managing what we're managing in front of us now and it has become more complex over time. It's a very complicated slide but I essentially want people to know that as a marine park authority, as marine park managers, we still want to spend time managing at the broadest area, managing the direct threats that we can manage. Uh, the things that we do, like marine park zoning as fundamentals, still need to be there for us to manage what, what is going on. However, at times, and this uh, conference and symposium is a little bit about when we do decide to slide down to the other end and what the implications of that are. Sometimes it can be hard to keep people focused up the other end. Uh, politicians, people, community often want quick wins, things quickly, uh, whereas the, the zoning and other things that we do take time and don't show results immediately. So there, there's some challenges there. And the biggest one is that when we go down the bottom end, it costs a lot more. Um, as an example, one of the things that we do continually do is the zoning plan and its compliance across the world, uh, across the marine park. They're slides that I don't expect you to be able to read, but just look at the, the dots and distribution throughout the zones. That's five years worth of recreational fishing non-compliance and commercial fishing non-compliance. So we've got a big area to look after in maintaining our base management. We have had the blueprint come out that talks about enhancing some of that base management, such as enhancing compliance, but it also acknowledges what we're here talking about today, some of the local active restoration, the stewardship, the partnerships that we need to have going forward in managing the marine park. I want to skip you to, through two examples to show that, particularly in an island context, we've been not only managing at a broad level, i.e. Our, our legislation that sets up national parks, protects species, protects habitats. But we've had some, some examples, and I'm going to use the two, two islands that are pretty well bookends of the reef, Lady Elliot Island and Rain Island, to talk about this. This is Lady Elliot Island in about the 1930s to 1950s, after it was guano mine, stripped, had every tree taken off it. That's it, uh, only a few years ago with an ecotourism resort on it, and one of the citizens of the science photos you just saw is, is uh, of Peter Gash, uh, the resort owner there. Um, and essentially, we've done a lot of work, and a lot of other people have done a lot of work to put some things back there to restore it, and we have a program that is actively going down to restore Lady Elliot Island. It's important because of its seabird biomass, uh, on the reef. So it's not just any island, it's still a special island in terms of its conservation values. But what I want to point out is that it's still a novel ecosystem. So it's not what it was. I don't know what the habitat of Lady Elliot Island was before those photos were taken. And I know what it is now, and it's a, a pretty good place and contributes to the conservation of the reef. And I think we should think about some of those things in a marine context. The other one is the Rain Island Recovery Project, a partnership between the Queensland government led by the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and BHP Billiton. Uh, it's at the other end of the reef and it is probably the jewel in the crown of biodiversity uh, when you crawl up out of the water onto an island. From both the seabird perspective but also the largest green turtle breeding population left on the planet. And 90% of the turtles in the northern Great Barrier Reef stop breed on that one island. So if breeding is not going well, that population will crash. And that was the advice we were given some years ago. So we did a few things there, and you can see some turtle carcasses in the foreground over that phosphate cap cliff. This island has also been mined for guano. So about at least two metres taken off the top of it. We put some pool fencing up. In the first year with 150 metres of pool fencing, we saved between 40 and 50 mature breeding turtles. We've now got most of the cliffs on the island uh, sorted out and we've saved, we're saving, while we're not there, thousands of turtles in big breeding seasons. And we did that, but then we wanted to do more because that wasn't sorting out hatchling reproduction. And we had to deal with water, turtles nesting in water. I don't know whether that's because of climate change and sea level rise or whether it's a change in sand profile on the island. But 
But I know that if you want more turtles, you've got to get the sand above that level. And we went to some more risky interventions with good science advice and guidance. And that's not the bit that I want to focus on here. What I want to focus on is some of the other things that are not just the physical doing of what we do. So how do we move forward in managing things? I'm talking about us taking a step into managing the world's remaining largest green turtle breeding population. If we get it wrong, it has serious consequences. We've managed to do it there, and on the board there are some of the things that we really need to start thinking about in any projects that we're looking at. And you do have to manage them carefully because you don't get too many chances at it as well. And some of that is in about the cautious approach, approach that we need to take going forward with restoration while still understanding the sense of urgency. It's not all about conservation values and much of what we've heard about is from stakeholders and the Marine Park Authority, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service need to work to manage those stakeholders and manage the traditional owner interests as well. And uh, to me, it, it, it's about the changing face of marine park management. In 2012, at the International Coral Reef Symposium, myself and, and then a long-time executive of Cabrumpa, Andrew Ski, spoke about thinking that we needed a paradigm shift in how we manage the park, and that was one into looking at more interventions. And I'm actually heartened to see that in those six years, I think we've come a long way that we're sitting here actually talking about it. We've got a long way to go, but I, but I think that the steps are there and we just need to keep knowing that we need to work through them. It's a bigger toolbox and we're going to need to let more people use that toolbox. The Marine Park Authority is always, uh, uh, I think with public and community support being about managing the direct human threats, taking pressure off and letting the ecosystem look after itself. And the blueprint for us clearly demonstrates that we need to ch challenge that in the future. Um, that the work that um, uh, Ann, Adam uh, mentioned with Reef Ecologic, I think is a good example of where that partnership can move towards uh, doing some, some things. So I think the work that Adam and Reef Ecologic have done is got community support, built the understanding of what it means to remove macroalgae at Magnetic Island. And government agencies, government resources don't always allow for that work to happen. And I think we're ready to take some of the things like macroalgae removal into the next step at Magnetic Island. And there's many, many more good ideas that we need to flourish. But the uh, where to from here, um, I, I think we do need to start thinking about the marine environment a little bit differently. Like I showed you with the islands, not all islands in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area are created equally. And similarly, not all reefs into the future, I think, will be created equally. Some will have conservation values that are high. Some will have tourism and economic and social values that are very high. Whoop. Only one. And I'm sorry. Can I get that back? <laughs> Damn. Um, so, so I think, think there's many questions for us to actually think through about when we're going to use a new and bigger toolbox. We don't have all the answers as a managing authority for that yet, and I think that that's going to still need to develop over time, um, and I guess that's the most important message. There's still going to be decisions on when best to use whatever tools we develop into the future. Thank you.